people came from all over to hear Jesus teach and preach about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, a massive crowd gathered outside the synagogue to hear him speak. Like any crowd, they were coming from many different places and many different perspectives. Young and old, men and women, rich and poor. But every person in that crowd had this one thing in common. They were tired. Tired of life. Tired of religion. Tired of waiting. And so he looked out upon this multitude of people who were scared, confused, and tired. And he told them, come to me. And that offer still stands for every one of us. Come to Jesus. All who are tired, all who are hurting, all who feel unworthy, all who feel unloved, all who have nothing left to give, come to Jesus. Bring your burdens, bring your fears, bring your biggest regrets and your worst mistakes. Bring your broken dreams and your painful disappointments. Bring your chains and bring your addictions. Bring it all and come to Jesus. Because he will receive you and he will redeem you. He will love you and he will lead you. He will accept you and forgive you. He will guide you and comfort you. He will care for you and watch over you. He will transform you and sustain you. So all who are weary, all who are lost, all who are tired, come as you are. Come today. Come to Jesus. I mean, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand together. Let's sing a little bit. Come on. worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves. To the God who always makes a way Cause he hung up on that cross Then he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on! We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Lord. 
Lord today And we won't be quiet oh, yeah. We're gonna we shout out in praise There's joy in the house there of the Lord there Our is God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We're gonna we shout out in praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord Y'all can be seated. It's great to see you today. We're so glad that you're here. If you're happy to be in the Lord's house today, say amen. amen. Our teens are back from camp. They had a great week. I've heard a lot about how hot it was. Whew, it was hot this past week. How many of you glad to be sitting in a building this morning with air conditioning? Yeah, I knew I'd get an amen on that. We're so glad that you're here. If you're our guest today, uh, first of all, we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming to worship with us here at Central. We are absolutely honored to have you with us. We always count it as a privilege and a joy to have new folks with us. So we ask you, if you would, do us a small favor. In the seat back in front of you, you'll find a card called a Connect card. If you'll take that card out today before leaving, just fill it out for us real quick. And then we invite you to stop by our Connect table out in the lobby. As you walk out the doors, it will be to your left over kind of by the water fountain. And there will be some people there. If you'll just take that card to them, they're going to give you a little bag. It's got some goodies in it few things that uh, we just want to express our thanks, but it's also got some information about some of our ministries and some of our Bible studies. And uh, we'd love to share more with you about the church, uh, but you know, I promise you, we don't just show up on you know Monday or Tuesday evening at six o'clock just in time for dinner. Uh, we would wait for an invite for that, but uh, we would like to be able to reach out to you either via email or through text messaging and uh, try to visit with you and share some stuff with you about what God is doing here at Central because God is definitely at work in our midst and we're grateful for that. So welcome and thank you so much for being here. I've got a few quick announcements for you real quick. Starting off next Saturday, the 29th is the day of our Kids World um, field trip and it's going to be over at Katie Inflatables on Mason Road. If you've signed your kids up for that, remember the drop-off location is not here at the church. It is actually at Katie Inflatables. They're asking you to drop your kids off at 1020 and you will be picking them up at 130. This afternoon, our Rejoice Choir rehearsals start back up at 2 o'clock. And I know the choir sings in the first service. And so sometimes people wonder, well, how can I attend second service, be a part of the choir, still go to Sunday school? We have several choir members that sing in the choir. And then when they're done, they just go to their uh, Bible study group or go to Kids World to serve over there. And uh, so we would love for you, if you want to be in the choir, we'd love for you to join with our choir this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Rehearsals start back up this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Upstairs, you just park out here in this parking lot, come in where it says offices and go straight up the stairs. And if you're wondering where to go, there'll be somebody there to guide you. Also, uh, this coming uh, Wednesday night, the 26th, our Kids Rejoice Choir rehearsals start back up, and they will quickly be diving into the Christmas production. You know, every year our Kids Rejoice Choir does an amazing Christmas production, and it will be great this year again. And uh, so if you want your kids to be in that, I would suggest that you dive in early. So that's going to start this Wednesday. And then the um, tryouts for the Christmas program will begin on August the 9th. But don't misunderstand that. If your kids come to the practices, they will be in the program. But there are only so many like special parts, right, Heather? And so those special parts, they're going to start um, auditions for those on Wednesday night. August the 9th. So if you show up with your child in September and the parts, the special parts are all gone, it's because you missed it. So August the 9th, 7 p.m. And then one more thing, out on the tables in the lobby, I, I have these cards out there. I asked for the landing here, I guess about a month ago, to make these up. 
because this is one thing that I know. Uh, it is a statistical fact that 98% of born again followers of Jesus Christ, people who have faith in the Lord Jesus, came to faith as a result of somebody inviting them to church. Now, this does not take away our responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. This does not negate that, but I'll tell you what this does. This, because a lot of people are afraid to do that. If we were to poll the audience, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. We're not going to, so no hands raised. But if we were to poll the audience this morning and ask people if you've ever actually personally, one-on-one -on -one with someone shared the gospel, we would be amazed at how many Christians who've been saved for years who've never done that. Now, this is not to say that you shouldn't do that as well, but I'll tell you what this does do. It's a simple invite, has our service times on the back for Sunday, Wednesday, doesn't matter if they speak Spanish, tells about our Spanish speaking services. Um, I wanna challenge you to take at least one one of these cards with you and make a commitment to the Lord that this week, okay, Lord, I've got this card. I'm going to pray over it. I'm going to ask you to put the right person in my path for me to put this in their hands and personally invite them to church. Now, if you'll do more, take more. Take as many as you would like because that's what they're there for. If we run out, we'll order more. I believe with all my heart that if the people of God will go out into this world as the word of God commands us to, and we will go out into the highways and the hedges, as the Bible says, and try to compel them to come. They will come. Now listen, this happens to me all the time. Not all of them are going to come. I have people tell me, Bryce, all the time. I invite them, man, I've been looking for a church. I'm like, great, man, isn't this ironic that I would invite you and you're looking and this is just the Lord bringing us together. Oh yeah, yeah, I will be there Sunday. And I get all excited, get their name, I'll go stand out there at the door waiting sometimes for them to show up. And 10 minutes after the service starts, I kind of go, well, I guess they're not coming. That happens. But you know what? Every now and then someone that tells me I'm coming, they come through that door. And I'll tell you, nothing brings more joy to me as a child of God than to go out and do the work that God's commanded me to do and then get to see fruit from it. So I want to encourage you, help us out. Help us out. There is a world full of people who need Jesus. And I'm thankful for every church that is concerned for the lost that's reaching out to this world to try to bring them into the house of God where they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me as we pray and ask God's blessing on the remainder of today's service? Lord Jesus, we're so thankful to be in your house this morning. God, we're so grateful for the gospel. Lord, we're thankful for our Savior. Lord, we're we're so thankful for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your love. And I pray, God, that you would empower us as a church body to reach out to the people around us. Lord, we have people here this morning, some drive from the south part of town, others from the north. Um, some people live right here around the corner. But Lord, you put us each where you want us and you have people in our paths every day that need to know you. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a burden for those who do not know you. I pray, Lord, that we would be compassionate and that we would be filled with your passion to reach out to them with your love and your gospel. God, we pray your blessings on the remainder of our worship this morning, our time of communion, and on the message. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.
you're my strength and you're my defender you're my refuge in this storm and through these trials you've always been It matters why we do this. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread. He gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. He took a cup. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. It is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. matters how we do this. Let each of us look at our lives. Let us recognize our sin. Let us see the grace of God in the body and blood of Christ, broken for us, poured out for our forgiveness. It matters that we do this. Let us eat the bread drink from the cup. Remember the Lord's death in our place on the cross, looking for his return. Amen. Uh, on your way in, you did not pick up the communion elements and need them. If you would just raise your hand. We've got some up front here. We've got some people that will pick up these plates. Could I get some help here? Jeremy, would you take that one? And anyone that's got their hand up, take it to them. All right, Landon's working this side. Just keep your hand up till they get to you, no problem. We've got plenty. We want to make sure everyone has them and can participate all who choose to. Um, I'm going to be, first of all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for the Lord's Supper. But if you want to turn your Bibles to the text today, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 is where we will be. Uh, for the duration this morning. Um, but at communion time, I, I never like to just like rush into communion, read the passage, eat the bread, drink the cup, pray and move on. Communion to me, um, it's a big deal. It, it matters. There are only two ordinances that Jesus Christ gave his church. One is baptism. The other one is communion. So communion is vitally important. You've got to remember when Jesus and his disciples, and I know that I say this a lot. If you've been here, you've heard me say this, but when Jesus and his disciples were coming into Jerusalem, someone still got their hand up here in the middle, Landon, the night before Jesus was to be arrested and tried and put to death, as they're coming in 
to Jerusalem, the disciples say, you know, should we go make ready the Passover meal? Jesus gives them instruction. They go to town. They find the upper room, just as Jesus told them it would be. And they gathered together for what the disciples believe was going to be their traditional Passover meal. Now, they may very well have had the Passover meal, as was the custom. And the Passover, they did this uh, not to keep their firstborn alive like happened way back when, when the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt and the Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. And then the final plague that God brought upon Egypt was the death angel passed over and God had instructed the children of Israel through Moses uh, slaughter the, the, the best newborn lamb that you have and take the blood of that lamb and put it over your doorpost. And when the death angel sees the blood, he will pass over you. But for every household that did not have the blood, the firstborn in that household would die. And this was the plague that eventually led uh, the Pharaoh to say, get the people and get out of Dodge. Don't want you here anymore. That is what God used to bring about uh, their release from slavery in Egypt. So every year thereafter, they would have Passover at that time to remember how God had set them free from slavery in Egypt. But on this night with Jesus and his disciples, the night before Jesus was to go to the cross, he instituted this new supper, this communion, this meal that we will have together this morning and he said, this meal, I want you to do it not in remembrance of being set free from slavery in Egypt. This meal is for all of my followers to remember what I set you free from, and that is from a life of sin. Jesus Christ, he is our Lord and he is our Savior. He is our savior because he sacrificed himself on the cross, making a payment for our sin that not one person on this earth could make for themselves. Did you hear me? No matter how good you've been, you still have sin. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and all come short of the glory of God. Therefore, none of us are clean in the presence of God. And the only way I hope you're listening because I believe someone needs to hear this today. The only way that we can be made clean and set free from our life of sin is by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. These elements, they tell that story. Jesus Christ gave his physical body to be punished in our place. When you picture Jesus on the cross, know this. He was there in your place. He was there in my place. Make it personal. Make it this morning as you picture him there. Make it about you and think about all the things that you've done, not only against other people, but against God directly that caused him to have to go to that cross. But know this, he loves you so much. It was worth, it was worth the cross. And Jesus says, I want you to, he told his disciples, take this bread, remember it, use it, to remember the fact that my body was beaten and bruised and broken for you. He said, drink this cup, which is symbolic of my blood, which was shed so that you could receive remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, so that you could receive eternal life, so that you could experience firsthand the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, and ultimately the love of God. So this morning, as we come to take these elements together as a church body, I want you to consider, and we're going to take just a moment of silence in just a second. The apostle Paul, when he's writing to the church at Corinth, I'm not going to go read the whole passage, but after these, after 23 through 26 in verse 27, he picks up and he says, um, listen, when you take these elements before you do take time to examine your own self. What does that mean? Look within your heart. And if there's anything in your heart, anything in your life, uh, unconfessed sin, bitterness, anger, wrath, whatever it is, you take time and you seek God and ask him to forgive you. And he says, if you can't, if you're unwilling, because sometimes Christians can be hard headed. Can I get a witness on that? Sometimes we can have a sin in our life and we know it's there. 
We don't need anyone to tell us, and we're going to talk more about that this morning in First John. We don't need anyone to tell us what's wrong with us. We know. We know because we have a spirit living in us that lets us know. When something is there, we don't need anyone to tell us. But sometimes we're just stubborn. We're like, I, I'm kind of enjoying that sin right now in my life. I want to continue in that sin. And if that's you this morning, it's not a good place to be. But let me encourage you, don't take these elements. Because the apostle Paul says, when we take these elements and we don't do it with the right heart, the right spirit, the right attitude, he says, because of this, a lot of people in the church are sick. And I don't know, I just take God's word at face value. I believe that to mean that Paul was saying, there's people that are physically sick because they refuse to get their heart right before taking part of these elements. Kind of scary, isn't it? Think about this. He said, and some sleep. Some people died because they knowingly took these elements holding sin, bitterness in their heart. God takes this serious. This is a serious time. It's not just a religious exerciser box that we do so we can check and go, well, I was baptized when I got saved. Now I've taken communion. I'm good. That's not what this is about. This is to help us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. So before, before I read this passage, I want to take just a moment and I want to just ask all of you, just bow your heads and, and maybe you made preparation this morning before coming to the house of God. If so, amen, we all should. But I want to ask you, take just a moment in the silence of your own heart. Maybe you're not aware of anything, and that's good. But maybe you should just ask the Lord, Lord, is there something that I'm not even aware of that's in my heart right now that goes against you? And God, if so, if you'll just show it to me, I want to make it right with you. This is opportunity to examine your own heart. Lord, we stand before you this morning as a grateful people. Lord, there's not one of us here today who is without sin. Not even as Christians, we still sin. Help us, Lord, to be aware of those things in our life that displease you. Help us, Lord, to be willing to confess those things to you. Your word tells us, Lord, that if we will confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I pray, Lord, right now in this moment, each of us would make our hearts right with you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, giving them instruction concerning the Lord's table. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, he wrote, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this ordinance. Thank you for what they represent. Thank you, Lord, that you were willing to leave heaven and come to this sin-filled world and live a perfect sinless life and then pay our sin debt on the cross. May we never forget the cost of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 John for a while now. I, I, we're going to do an exhaustive study, God willing, and we're going to be here for a while. So today we're going to start in chapter 1, and we're going to begin by reading verses 1 through 4. If you would, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. And 
and I can tell that a lot of people are back now from vacation. You've blessed my heart by being in God's house today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. In verse one, John the apostle wrote, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for the privilege to be in your house this morning. And God, I pray in these next few moments that your Holy Spirit would speak into our lives. And Lord, my prayer is that in my weakness, God, you would be made strong and we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So here we go. A couple weeks ago, we did the introduction message to this series in 1 John. So today is actually the first message that we're digging in. Last week, we were blessed to have Brother Sam Thomas, missionary to India with us, and what a blessing he was. So let me begin this morning by just saying that we are living today. I'm talking 2023. We are living today in a time that is more uncertain and more unsettled, and there is more unrest, I believe, in our world today than there has maybe ever, ever been. I, I cannot say, at least in my lifetime, that I can remember ever our world experiencing such unrest and uncertainty in and around us. Let me give you some examples. I don't know if you're a news watcher, but I am. Sometimes I wished I wasn't. In fact, lately I've been trying to take a break from it because I'll tell you, if you put too much negativity in your mind, it will dominate you. But there are a lot of political insecurities in our world today. I don't care what party you're associated with. I'm not really so much talking about that, but just listen to what is going on all around the world. We hear that there's threat of war um, with China going to take Taiwan and anyone that stands in their way will be in trouble too. I, I, I don't know. I kind of think they mean it when they say it. We hear about the war in Ukraine with Russia. We hear the threat constantly from Iran that they want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. I mean, there are political insecurities all around the world. It's not just here at home. It is taking place everywhere. Not only are there political insecurities, church, there are economic unrest in our world. How many of you can remember what things cost just a few years ago, right? I mean, I know you older folks that are nodding. Some of the younger people are like, huh, I still get everything I asked for. All right, well, good for you. Mom and dad are good, but Things have gone up. There's economic unrest. One day the, uh, the stock market's up. The next day it's down. It's not stable. There's a lot of economic unrest in our world. Educational insecurities. We, I hear all the time on the news that our education system, I can't speak for the rest of the world. I can only talk to home. But I hear all the time that our education system is not what it was 15 or 20 years ago. Numbers are down. I'm not blaming the teachers. We're blessed in this church to have some wonderful God-fearing Christians who work in the public school education system. And we thank the Lord for you. But education by, on, by and large has many insecurities in it today. Now, I could sit here all morning and pick on things out in the world, but you know what else there is? There are insecurities within the church. Yes, we have evangelical insecurities in our world today. There's a lot of confusion in the world. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 reminds us, it says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. How many of you would agree this morning? There's a lot of confusion in the world. And yes, there's even confusion in the church. Yeah. 
But let me tell you something. God is not the author of confusion and he never has been. God is the author of peace, stability. Christianity has veered so far off path in recent years that unfortunately I have to say that even in many quote unquote Christian churches today, listen, a proper definition, and by proper I mean a biblical definition of a Christian in many churches cannot even be given. And this erosion of the truths of God's word is not something that happened overnight. This actually began as a very slow eroding process. And you're going to see as we study the epistle of 1 John that it didn't start in 2000. It didn't start in the 1900s. It started the moment, the day that the church of Jesus Christ began, the enemy, Satan, began to attack the church, infiltrate the church, trying to destroy, distort the truth of God's word. So this erosion process began way back then and it began slowly, but I will tell you as each day passes, it only seems that the process is accelerating and getting faster and faster as time goes by. We have seen what was once considered to be absolute truth turned into, well, that's their opinion. We have seen dogmatism, which is Facts replaced with agnosticism. We have watched as humanism in our world is on the rise. Words like insecurity, uncertainty, change. These have become words that we hear so often. If you don't believe me, go home tonight, turn on any cable news network, and you will hear those words at some point during the broadcast. These words have become a part of our everyday life. And sadly, church, even within the organized church, even the church has fallen victim to these things. And many organized religious groups today are following the lead of Satan and helping to make our world a place of insecurity and uncertainty. Unfortunately, many churches today have replaced biblical absolutes with relativism. I hear that word all the time. And in doing so, what they have done is they have replaced biblical truth with falsehood. They have replaced biblical truth with lies. The church of Jesus Christ, let me remind you, is supposed to be based upon the word of God. That is, this is the foundation of the church. Not only is it the foundation of the church, dear friends, it is the foundation, it is supposed to be the foundation of every Christian life. In case you did not know it, let me tell you something about the book that you hold in your hand. It is a book of certainty. It is a book of security. It is a book of moral absolutes. Make no mistake about it, God is not confused. He's not like this world. He's not confused. He is certain. He's not uncertain about anything, and he never, ever has been. The church, however, has become confused and uncertain in many things. And it's often asking the question, what is right? What is wrong? What is our purpose in life? What's the purpose of our existence? I'm telling you, church, our churches all over this world are absolutely filled with people who are confused about God's absolute truth. I hear people all the time saying, there's no such thing as absolute truth. The situation that we have isn't anything new. But I'm telling you, as time passes, as the clock ticks, the departure from truth and certainty is accelerating at a rapid rate. The enemy that we fight against, he's referred to in the Bible as the great deceiver. Revelation chapter 12 verses 7 through 9 says, listen as it speaks of him. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Satan and his angels lost that war too. They prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. 
And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And let me tell you something about him. He has been working ever since that moment to try and distort the truth of God's word. The issues that we face in the world and in the church today, these are not anything new. These were problems that were present in the early days of the church. And I believe that that is why the Spirit of God moved upon John the Apostle to pen 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st John, which is where we're going to be at least for the next two or three months. It is an appropriate and a needed message for us today in 2023. And I'm telling you, I believe that with all my heart because in the days in which we are living, these are days that are full of uncertainties. In 1 John, he deals with absolutes. He deals with assurities. He deals with facts, not opinions. Now, I never mean to upset anybody. I, you can ask my wife. I am a peacekeeper. I do not like to intentionally make someone mad. I don't want to intentionally ruffle somebody's feathers. I don't intentionally like to, to try to get debate and arguing going with someone. But in these next few months, I'm going to be preaching as I always have straight from God's word. But let me tell you something. Some of the things that you may hear may trouble you. Because we're dealing in absolutes, we're dealing in facts. Like I told you in the introduction a couple weeks ago, John is very black and white. There are no gray areas. It's either right or it's wrong. It's of God or it's of the devil. We struggle with that. Because as Christians, we all the time do things that we know aren't of God, but we don't want to believe that we're doing things that are of him. But according to God's word, if it's not of God, it's of this world. And if it's of this world, it's of our father, the devil is what Jesus said. I've heard many people say, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's no such thing as absolute truth. I'm telling you, they are dead wrong. The lies and uncertainties have crept their way into the church. And the purpose of Satan in doing this is to defraud the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is his sole intention is to defraud the gospel and prevent the lost from coming to Christ. The epistles of John were written to counteract these uncertainties and these false teachings that had made their way into church. First John is a letter that is very certain and very absolute. John, here's what he does, and you're going to see it as we go throughout the study. He states the facts, but then he leaves no room for debate or argument. I mean, how many times have you talked to someone and you've tried to state a fact that you knew to be true and then they want to start to bring up the questions and the clouds and the doubts and start to debate and you get drawn in and you start that. When John does this, there's no room for debate. There's no room for argument. You can, ex you can reject it and walk away, but it doesn't change the fact that it is true. First John is a letter of boldness. It's a letter of confidence, but keep in mind, it's a family letter. You're going to see many times throughout this text where John says, little children, my brothers. Hey, how many of you as parents have ever had to say something hard, a hard truth to your kids? Raise your hand. This is what John is doing here. He's not, he's not trying to beat us up. He's not trying to to insult us and make us cower. He's telling us the truth and he's doing it in love because he wants what is best for us. So he is very certain and he is very absolute. This book, the first book of John, it's based upon what you know. Or at least let me say it's based upon what we should know. First John chapter two, verses 20 and 21 says, but ye have an unction from the Holy one and you know all things. You know how many times I've had people come to me and say, pastor Roy, I've got this situation and I'm just curious if this is right. And usually when I hear that, I already know something 
And that is this, it is wrong. And they're hoping they can get the preacher, the man of God, to sanction what it is they're about to do. You see, because if a person's, now if someone's lost and they come to me, because there are lost people in every church around this world, there's not a church on this planet that is 100% saved people. I mean, unless it's just a family of two meeting at home and me and Shirley, Shirley Baptist Church, know we're both saved. I'm talking a church that's populated with people from different families and different backgrounds. There's not a church out there with 100% saved people. But you know, when a truly born, and, and they might come, someone lost may come to me and say, hey, I, I want your opinion on this. And they're sincere because they just don't have that Holy Spirit in them that can give them the unction to know the truth. But I'm telling you what the Bible says. You have an unction from the Holy One. You know all things. You don't need a preacher to tell you if something's right or wrong. You already know. John said, I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it. And then no lie is of the truth. 1 John 2, 28. And now little children, there's that phrase, he's writing to family, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 3, 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. 1 John 4, 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness. God wants his children to be bold in his truth that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. 1 John 5, 14, I love this verse. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. In the introduction message a couple weeks ago, I told you that John deals in three absolutes or certainties. First of all, the certainty of Jesus Christ. In other words, belief in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that Jesus is God in human flesh. Believe that Jesus was 100% man while at the same time 100% God. Some of the people in the early church in John's day, that's what he was writing about. They were like, well, we can accept him as Messiah, but we cannot believe that he was man. We have to believe that he was both deity and humanity at the same time. Secondly, the necessity of absolute obedience to the commands of God. We need to be obedient to the word of God, church. People ask me, are the Ten Commandments in that Old Testament law? It's about the character of God. I mean, if you have a problem with keeping the Ten Commandments, you don't think that's the way God would want you to live, then maybe you don't have the same spirit living in you that I do. But when I break one of those commandments, God convicts my heart about it. Then the thirdly, the need for brotherly love. Remember John said in chapter one, verse four, and these things we write unto you, watch this, so your joy might be full. Every Christian knows that our life is supposed to be a joy-filled life. Dear friends, these certainties, belief, obedience, and love, they are going to produce three things in our life. When we have these certainties at work, we believe that Jesus Christ is who he is. We have obedience to his word and to his commands, and we have love for the brethren. The result of that will, number one, be joy. Just like verse four says, we write this unto you so that your joy will be full. Secondly, it will be holiness. First John chapter two, verse one, my little children, these things write I unto you that you what? That you sin not. No Christian should intentionally continue a life filled with sin. I get asked all the time, can a person be this and be a Christian? Can a person be this? And I'm not naming the this is because I might leave yours out, but you can just fill in the blank with whatever you want. We're all sinners. A person can be anything and be a Christian, but they cannot be right with God if sin is ruling in their life. Period. I don't care what their church tells them. 
They can take the truth of God's word out of context and make it fit to a certain lifestyle, a certain group, certain sin, but it doesn't change the facts. God is God. He is absolute. He is certain. He doesn't like any of our sin. So don't go filling in the blank with other people's. You deal with yours. You see, I keep, my wife can't stop me from the sins that she knows I'm guilty of is all she can do is work on herself. Amen? Thirdly, security, joy, holiness, and security. 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, not that you hope, not that you cross your fingers, no, that you may know that you have absolute assurance that you have eternal life. And guys, watch this. When all three of these certainties exist in the life of a follower of Christ, they are going to produce fellowship with God and fellowship with the brethren. They're also going to produce obedience to the commands of God. And thirdly, they will give us assurance and security in Christ Jesus. Watch this. The first one, belief in Christ. It deals with the theological Second one, obedience to commands. That deals with the moral. And thirdly, love for the brother. And that deals with the social aspects of life. And watch this. John is so certain. He's so certain about these three things that they need to be present in the life of a Christ follower that he goes as far as to say this. Listen carefully. Basically, this is what John's saying. He's saying, you can tell if a person who professes faith in Christ is genuine by whether or not these three things are present in their life. Now, let me remind you, Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. For with the same measure that you judge, it will be measured to you again. John's not calling here for judgment. But what he is telling us is that we can know if a person is what they claim to be by these evidences in their life. And what John is saying is that if all three of these are not present, then you can know that the person is simply claiming to be something that they are not. Now, I do believe there are times that certain people claim to be a part of the family of God and they themselves have convinced themselves that they are based upon their own activity, but based upon the Bible that I read, based upon God's word, it is by grace through faith that we are saved. It's not because of anything that we have done. It's all about trusting in Jesus. And I'm telling you the three things that John points to here, they are foundational. They are the basis of the entire epistle. And John states these repeatedly throughout. So if you don't like them in the next few weeks, you'll want to be plugging your ears some because they're going to come up time and time and time again. I'm telling you this morning, nobody can truly claim to be a part of the family of God unless they have a proper belief about Jesus Christ being the son of God. I have people try to convince me sometimes, but in God's justness, don't you believe Pastor Roy, God is just? Yes. Well, don't you think that he wouldn't send a well-meaning person to hell just because they don't believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be? And is all I can respond is, I'm sorry, I disagree with you. Anyone who rejects Jesus will spend an eternity separated from the presence of God. I didn't say it. God did. He's certain He's not confused. John points to three, three ways we can know that Jesus is who he claimed to be. We'll quickly cover them. Number one, first, the historical event itself. In verse two, John wrote, for the life was manifested. God's son, Jesus Christ, was born in human form into this world. He made himself known to man by becoming one himself. Second, the apostolic testimony in verses two and three, John writes, for the life was manifested, listen, and we have seen it and we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and declare we unto you. John and the other apostles could give firsthand eyewitness testimony to Jesus Christ. And there is a third way. We have testimony of the spirit that lives within us. 
as believers. 1 John 2.20, but you have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you. This is not casting away with the need for discipleship. We are all supposed to be involved in discipleship. You teach me, I teach you. Iron sharpens iron. But what he is saying is, you know these things things, but as the same anointing teaching you all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. This is what John is stressing is that we must acknowledge the deity of Jesus Christ to claim to know God and yet reject and deny the deity of Christ only proves one thing. Are you listening? It only proves that that person does not know Jesus Christ. In the opening paragraph of his letter, John begins with the certainty of the deity of Christ, and he gives three specific certainties about him and his gospel. And I'll give them quick, I promise. The gospel, number one, is unchanging. We do not have, friends, a progressive gospel. We need to hear that because I'm telling you, a different message is being taught in many houses of worship today. This is not a progressive book. It's not a progressive gospel. In verse one, he begins with the words, that which was from the beginning. And I understand something here. He's not talking about the beginning like we see in Genesis chapter one, verse one, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's not the beginning that he's talking about, but rather he's referencing the beginning of the gospel, the word of life, he says. That is a reference to the gospel message, which when it is received, it brings life to the lost sinner. John is saying we are proclaiming the exact same gospel message from the very beginning of the gospel. Got to remember, it's about 90 AD when John's writing this. It's been a good 60 years since Jesus was here. He's saying it's the same gospel it was then. But in that 60 years, a lot of lies and mistruths have crept their way into the church. And that's what John is dealing with. And God gave him foresight to know that in the future, churches would be dealing with the same issues and the same problems. He says the message that we're sharing with you, it's the same message that was shared in the very beginning of the gospel preaching ministry. Friends, you want to know how to tell a false teacher for sure? You want to know how to identify a false teacher? I have people come to me all the time. I got this book by this author, Pastor Roy. What do you think? And a lot of times it's someone I've never even heard of. That doesn't mean they're not good, but we should be careful. We should do a little research. Anytime... Uh, Someone, you want to identify one when someone comes and they says, hey, I got something new. If they come offering something new, something different than the good old time gospel, then you need to kick them to the curb and stay away from them because they're coming with lies. And let me tell you something else about it. It doesn't mean that they will not be coming in the name of Christ. Remember, there are many false Christ. It's important for us to remember that the gospel never changes. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. If someone comes along and they have some new doctrine or so some new revelation of Christ that they want to share with you, don't take it, don't listen to it, run from them. Hang on to the old one. In other words, be dogmatic. Because the new one, I can assure you of one thing. It is heresy. It is false. It is not of God. I see commercials sometimes. Call this number. We'll give you a King James Version Bible and another testament of Jesus Christ. Don't call that number. You need a free King James Bible? We'll give you one. You don't need any other testament. Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Christian Science, amongst many others. These are heresies, church. And these demonic doctrines are not to be considered. People say, well, I just want to explore it. I just want to see what they... Be very careful. It's, 
If you're very mature and very grounded in God's word, and you just want to know what they believe for the sake of talking to those who follow it, fine. But if you're not, don't venture out into something you're not ready for. What we need to hang on to is the old gospel truth. Jude 3 says it this way, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it's always been the same. It's always been the same. People right now who the Spirit of God is dealing with are saying, I'm just not ready. I'm not sure yet. Every person in this room who you know is a follower of Jesus had to come the same way. It's a common salvation. He said, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Galatians 2, 5, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, the apostle Paul said to the people at Corinth, for I have delivered unto you First of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. I know my time is gone. I've got more. We'll just pick up next week. But let me close with this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everyone in between, please listen to this. Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. That is the gospel plus or minus nothing. It's all about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and in the grave and in his resurrection. And let me just tell you something. If you don't know him, you can today. The Bible tells us that he sits at the right hand of the father making intercession for us. If you will come to him with a repentant heart saying, God, Lord Jesus, I need you. There's no magic words. I'm always cautious to lead people in a prayer because they might think, oh, if I don't say those exact words, God made you. He gave you your vocabulary. You just talk to him and be you, but tell him, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. I know that you're the way, the truth, and the life, and I want you to come in and be my savior and my Lord. Nobody needs an explanation of savior, but just in case you did not know He wants to be your Lord too. And that means he wants to be the master of your life. Would you bow with me this morning? I don't know where each of you are at this morning, but I'm telling you, if we're going to walk with Christ as Christians, we're going to grow in Christ as Christians. We must have these certainties in order. We must have our belief, right? We must be, Okay, fine. You've got your beliefs right. Now I want you to examine this. Are you obedient to his commands? And thirdly, are you loving the brethren? I see people all the time. Sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes I know about things. Things that I necessarily may not want to know about. But sometimes I know about things and I see people come in and sit on one side and someone else on the other. And I know... There's friction there. Guys, when that happens, not only do we disrupt our own fellowship with the Lord and with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we kind of mess it up for everybody. If there's something not right and you know it, get it right. Give forgiveness. Say, well, I don't want to be their best friend again. Well, you, I'm not saying that you have to spend Christmas together. But man, we need to love each other. We got to get our belief right about Jesus. We got to obey the commands. And then we need to have assurance. You see, the reason many times Christians doubt their salvation is because they've let something in their life that they already know because the unction from the Holy One, the anointing from the Holy One, they already know it shouldn't be there but it's there. And then the devil comes along and says, look at you. You can't call yourself a Christian and have that in your life. And we listen to him. And let me just tell you this. He's not the only one. The Holy Spirit says, hey, this is in your life and you know it's not right. I can't bless your life until you get right 
Invitation today is simple. First of all, if you need to accept Jesus Christ, that's the highest priority for any person here. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm not talking about going to church, being religious. I'm talking about a relationship with Christ. If you've never done that, today's the day. Right now is the time. Maybe you're here and you are a Christian. Haven't been witnessing the way that you should. You know you should. Haven't been doing a lot of things the way that you know you should. That's between you and God. The invitation is this. Would you come right now when we pray and sing? Would you just get on your knees for God? Say, God, you know what's wrong with me. You know what's wrong with me better than I know myself. But help me, Lord. I can't, I can't live the Christian life without Jesus giving me the power and the strength to do it. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can't do it on your own. Would you stand with me? Lord Jesus, we're just a, a grateful people who are glad, Lord, to be forgiven and to know your grace and your mercy. I pray, God, that you would use these messages in 1 John to do exactly what John intended them to do, and that was to strengthen us in our faith, to give us assurance of our salvation, to help us to be bold in our faith. But always remembering it's to be done in love as John the Apostle so clearly does. Help us, Lord, to grow in you. And help those who are not saved to just admit it and come to you for salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. As Brother Landon sings, well, however God spoken to you, maybe you know someone who desperately needs you to intercede for them. Would you this morning as we sing? You come right now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. But there's something about that name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name Master Savior Jesus like the fragrance after the
heard nothing but great things. And the Spirit of God was working in their hearts and did some things in their life and some kids, young people made commitments to Christ. You pray for them as a church family. Because I, I don't know how many of you have noticed that sometimes when you make a commitment to God, the old enemy comes up against you and he wants to defeat you and he wants to challenge you. Well, that's what our teens are fixing to experience if they have not already and especially when they go off back to school. Our enemy is real. And let me tell you what he wants more than anything. He wants the hearts and minds of our young people. Pray for our kids. Pray for our teens. Pray for our schools. Pray for our teachers. Folks, take it to God in prayer because he's the only one that can really change things. Amen? I love you all very much. Pick up some of these cards. I challenge you. Try to get someone to the house of God with you next week. You'll be amazed. I'll tell you what, you want, you want to make sure you get someone, try to invite about 50 people. Maybe one of the 50 will come, but if they do, it will be worth every ounce of effort you put forth. God bless you all.